While doing research for my Zelda documentary series, I sometimes come across interesting tidbits of information from the development of the Legend of Zelda franchise. But unfortunately, not all of this content is good enough to make it into the final script of the documentary. Still, it seems like a waste to not make mention of it in some way or another. So welcome to Zelda Facts, where each episode, I'll take a look at a few interesting facts I found while researching the history of the Legend of Zelda series. Let's begin! For our first stop on this new adventure, let's start with some interesting facts about one of my favorite Zelda games, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. In Wind Waker, you'll quickly cross paths with a pirate named Tetra. Later in the game, it's revealed that Tetra is in fact Princess Zelda, but she grew up not knowing who she really was. This twist is done really well in the game, but Tetra herself went through several design changes. Her earlier concept art doesn't depict her as a pirate at all. Instead, her garb is more akin to someone who might be found hanging out on Windfall Island. According to series producer Eiji Awanuma, Tetra was always planned to be revealed as Princess Zelda, but this change could have meant that she was originally intended to play a completely different role in the game. I can't really imagine Tetra playing any other role besides a pirate, but if I had to guess, perhaps Tetra was originally supposed to play the role of the rich guy's daughter. While that does seem like a strange pick, I would assume her father and mother would have tried to make sure she had a good life, despite keeping her true identity a secret from her. However, that had to have been very early on in the game's development because of this next fact. I bet you didn't realize that Tetra has a pretty tragic backstory, did you? Well, according to Eiji Awanuma, it goes a little something like this. Tetra's mother died when she was little, so Tetra herself has no idea that she's actually Zelda. But her mother told her a number of things. You can visit Tetra's room in the game, and inside you'll find a picture of the Master Sword. Tetra's mother told her to find it, but not even Tetra knows what it will mean for her. She just thinks it's a treasure to be sought by pirates. That's why she's continuing to lead her pirate horde, searching for treasures such as the Master Sword and the Triforce, as well as the legendary hero. The picture of a green-clad boy that can be found in her room hints at her destiny. It is a little sad when you think about it, and it's also very interesting to me, since I've played Wind Waker more times than I can count, and I don't think any NPC ever makes mention of Tetra's mother at all. It's kinda neat that Nintendo goes through all this extra effort to build out a character, despite some, if not all of it, going completely unnoticed by the player. This could just be me, but it makes me appreciate Tetra a little bit more. Okay, okay, so enough about Tetra. What about our boy Link? Well, according to Awanuma, Link in The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is apparently around 12 years of age. However, he was originally intended to be much older, similar to adult Link from Ocarina of Time, so maybe around 17 years old. Early concept art of Toon Link actually shows him in different stages of his adolescence, and the statue that's seen in Hyrule Castle is believed to be a relic of this original idea. Although that's never been confirmed by Nintendo, so at this point it's just fan speculation. Personally, I'm not sure how I feel about this one. Having an older version of Toon Link would have been cool, but having the passage of time play a role in another game directly following both Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask seems like a little bit too much to me. The Wind Temple featured in The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker may have been a scrapped idea from its predecessor Ocarina of Time. In a pre-release screenshot from Ocarina of Time, Link has a wind medallion, Although this medallion shares the design of the forest medallion from the final game, leftover text that can be accessed using a game shark reveals that this item was indeed at one point called the Wind Medallion, likely named after the temple's theme. It's worth noting that the medallion is equipped to the C button, meaning that it could actually be used to perform an action by the player at this point in the game. Some fans speculate that this was originally going to be Faeror's Wind. Either way, we're getting a little off topic now. It's just nice to see that even if an idea doesn't work in one game, Nintendo doesn't just completely throw it away. Instead, they held on to it for a few years and eventually we got that wind-themed temple in The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Although we also had to deal with Makar, so unfortunately, not everything was for the better. The Triforce Collection Quest is one of the most controversial and tedious parts of Wind Waker. So much so that Nintendo actually changed this portion of the game for its HD remake on the Wii U. Even with these changes, the quest still feels a little rushed and unpolished when compared to the rest of the game. Well, the reason for that is actually quite simple. Wind Waker was originally supposed to feature 9 total dungeons. However, due to time constraints, the team was forced to scrap 2 entire temples that would have served as a replacement for this Triforce Collection quest. 
It's currently unknown what the theme of these dungeons would have been, but one can only imagine what it would have been like. I know I personally would have loved to play through more temples over searching for sunken treasure any day. I do wonder how exactly that would have played out though. Because you do have to collect 8 pieces of the Triforce in the game, I suppose they would have had to split them up between the two temples, but I can't help but wonder what trials they would have put in place to protect each piece of the Triforce. Like most other Zelda games, Wind Waker has its fair share of cut content. For one reason or another, at least two possible island ideas were scrapped at some point in development. The first and more popular among the two is GC Island, a simple square looking island intended to represent a Nintendo GameCube, the system that Wind Waker originally released on. Ultimately, this concept never made it into the game. However, Nintendo again, never refusing to let an idea go to waste, revisited this concept in the sequel to Wind Waker on the DS, Phantom Hourglass. In that game, players can visit an island called DS Island, which as you can imagine, looks exactly like a Nintendo DS. The other island cut from the game was going to be called Stovepipe Island. It would have featured a massive volcano with steam erupting from the peak, a hot spring lake, and a magma river flowing into a valley along the countryside. Not much else is known about this scrapped island, but one design note states that its inhabitants all like to smoke tobacco. If I had to guess, that's probably one of the reasons why it was cut from the game. Given the cartoony nature of Wind Waker, and Nintendo's reputation of being kid-friendly, an entire island of people smoking tobacco might not have been the best idea. How about this one? Nintendo was originally planning to make a direct sequel to Wind Waker on the GameCube. However, due to poor sales of Wind Waker in the West, Nintendo of America assumed the players didn't approve of the cartoony art style. That was one of the key factors in Nintendo's shift to a more mature tone, which ultimately led to the development of Twilight Princess. Eventually, we would get those sequels, but on the DS in the form of Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks. Granted, this is a pretty commonly known fact, but to me it's interesting to see just how much has changed over the years. Today, Wind Waker is very well received, and I can't help but wonder what things would have been like if we actually got a console sequel to Wind Waker, instead of the less than spectacular DS titles. Wind Waker features some pretty iconic races in both the Koroks and the Rito. Both would end up being revisited in the franchise's newest installment, Breath of the Wild, but the Rito are particularly interesting because they went through a few different design changes. Originally, the wings were much less pronounced, but after realizing flight would be key in getting certain characters like the Postman or Prince Kamali around, the developers decided to change the design to emphasize their wings so players would inherently understand they were capable of flight. According to some leftover design documents, Wind Waker had at least two entire species cut from the game. The first is an indescribable furry creature. According to the notes, they would have been always angry looking, and if they got further agitated, they would begin to bounce around. The other would be a talking pea person. These pea creatures would be found inside trees and drop down to talk to the player. It's unknown what information they would give or what they would say, but I like to imagine they would have given you hints on where sunken treasure is, or perhaps some information about each island you find them on. And one more random fact before I go. This one really isn't related to Wind Waker at all, but in 2016, Shigeru Miyamoto revealed that Nintendo has toyed with the idea of making a spin-off Zelda game focusing on the character Sheik. Whether or not this game would take place before, after, or during the events of Ocarina of Time is unknown, as the idea has never been developed into any prototypes or ideas beyond this initial concept. Despite that, the dream to make a game around Sheik a reality is still very much alive, and perhaps one day, given enough support, we can see it happen. Anyway, that's where I'm going to end off this video. I hope you guys enjoyed the very first episode of Zelda Facts. If you know any interesting facts about The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, or really any other Zelda game, let me know in the comments down below. Be sure to subscribe and tell me what Zelda game you'd like to see me talk about next. Once again though guys, my name is Matt, thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.